terms that you probably already looked at with the two chapters ago. So we have littoral, benthos. We haven't talked about this much. Neuston, the microscopic stuff that lives on top. There's a whole suite of organisms that are adapted to that, and we'll have a special section on special unusual environments. Pelagic is open water, fairly unstructured habitat. So you can imagine something that does well filtering, but they can't deal with this spatial heterogeneity. The deep benthic zone, profundal benthos, all these animals that perhaps can live with lower oxygen, um, do well in sediments. Because it's a lake, it tends not to be very much heterogeneity in the habitat there. Littoral water column, things that might be more related um, to the tied to the benthic zone, not do so well in the open area. And you can, and then there's examples of the types of species that you might find dominating in each of these habitats. So that's when we go through the major species. Say, oh, this one tends to be benthic. This one tends to be pelagic, or you know, the member the group has members of both. <coughs> One of the other sort of central ideas is that there's relationships between the species area and diversity. And this came initially from island biogeography, where people found that small islands tend to have low diversity and larger islands tend to have more diversity. Part of that's because of the degree of habitat complexity that's there. If you have a small island, you can only have so much heterogeneity in habitat, right? If you have a continent, you can have all, all different kinds of habitats that you have much more. And the other part of that equation is colonization. If you have a large island, the chances are you'll get a bigger variety of colonizers to get onto that habitat. And this does hold this idea between the relationship between the number of species holds from diatoms to fish. <coughs> Ruth Patrick, who we had in your book, is one of the biographies. When this theory of island biogeography came out, she immediately went out and threw glass sides out into a river and looked at the number of diatome species per slide and showed that the larger area of glass slides collected essentially more species. Okay, so it works for microbes. Um, here's one for turning over rocks in Australia. The bigger rocks have more species. We're gonna try to do this at Pillsbury Crossing in the lab or so. And then these last data are from Tun and Magnuson, and they looked at the number of species as a function of size of lakes, and found that we had this sort of saturating logarithmic relationship, but that a very small lake has very few species of fish. So some empirical data to support that idea. Larger area habitats have more diversity. So now we're past the patterns, and we're going to talk about um, invasions of non-native species. And while most invaders are not successful, if they are successful, it's almost impossible to eradicate them. And for that reason, they are one of the forms of permanent pollution, if you want to think of it that way. Radioisotopes also take almost forever to go away. But things like nutrients, nutrient pollution, um, toxic organic materials, those will eventually be dissipated or, or used by the environment in some way or another. So there's, the problem is with, with understanding why invasive species come in is that it's really hard to predict which species is going to be a successful invader. And so much of the stuff that goes around this science is based more on understanding which characteristics of particular species are that makes them prone to be successful, but predicting whether they will be or not. So the first point is that most invaders fail to establish. You've got to throw a lot of invaders in a habitat to get it to get species in there. Another way of looking at that is if you want to keep a habitat from being invaded, you want to decrease the number of species that are added to the environment and decrease the probability as much as possible. 
most invaders have no significant effect. So we saw, for example, watercress out in, the, in, in Kings Creek. It was added to the streams in the, in the southwestern United States by the Spanish when they came through. Not huge effects on the food webs in those streams. So it's there, it's new, but you know, so what? All aquatic systems can be invaded. None, none is basically you don't you can't assume that a uh, system can be invaded. Low diversity systems are prone to the strongest community level effects, right? And that's because there's just not much diversity in traits there. And if you put a brand new trait in, it can totally swamp everybody out. Top predators tend to have strong effects because they eat everything. Pretty straightforward, right? Species have to be adapted to, to the habitat to invade successfully. So you're not going to take a tropical large predator, release it in the lake here, and have it survive any more than one season, because it wants, it wants temperature drops, it's gone. Invaders tend to be more likely to be established in disturbed systems. That makes sense. They're just, there's, there's room for things that aren't competitive at the beginning to move in. Environmental variability can play a role in establishment. I think this is just sort of, a, it depends. Like anything that happens in the environment can alter, can play a role. That's, that's not a very strong statement there. Um, stable systems still can be vulnerable. So even a stable, diverse system is not prone, is not um, resistant, completely resistant to invasion. And getting back, the greater the number of invaders and the number of invasions, the greater probability of success. So that's the same thing as most up here when we're talking about this, that the higher the probability is, one, the more individuals of a species you put in, and two, the more often you put them in, the higher it's going to the probability of success is going to be. These that have a history of prior invasions are likely to invade successfully again. And we have these series of species that we know cause problems everywhere in the world that they're put, right? they'll probably cause problems in the next place they go. So zebra mussels are a classic example. We know what's going to happen when they get into a lake, so all we've got to do is try to keep them out. Um, I should also mention in this context that fisheries uh, managers have a long history of, of promoting these types of problems. Um, that is a, a sort of an idea that you can bring in a species from outside and somehow it will make the system better for angling or more productive. And this is based on the concept that there are empty niches or things that are not exploited in an environment. So this second point, most successful invaders have no significant effects, that can be true, but it's difficult to figure out and you need to know that before you put the, put the species in. So probably one of the most widespread non-native uh, aquatic freshwater species is trout. It's been put all over the world just for anglers, basically. Any cool water system that didn't have it, almost now at least large area has it. So, you know, South America, New Zealand, Australia, all over the place, Tasmania, all over the place, it gets thrown in there. And then moving different species of trout around with the idea that one's better than the other. So we have situations where Brook trout is sort of an invasive, weedy species in the Rocky Mountains because it can reproduce real fast and little, and it's not, you know, not great to catch there. But it's essentially endangered in the Northeast, or at least being protected in the Northeast where it's native. Same with brown trout um, coming from Europe to the United States. So there's a lot of these examples. I think there's going to get less common, and the the emphasis for fisheries managers is going to be trying to maintain the native fisheries. And it's getting more and more that way uh, over time. Uh, but still, you know, we're throwing trout in near Tuttle Creek Reservoir probably pretty soon in a little outlet stream. And it's, you know, what good does that really do other than it's just to put and take fishery? And I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's not a native stream either, but it's, it's, it's something that as, as some of you being future fisheries managers need to be thinking about what your philosophy is on it and when it's correct to do it and when it's not correct to do it. So I just wanted to bring up that point. 
uh, one of the examples, so we talked about zebra mussels coming into the Great Lakes and being released in ballast water, um, but this is a partial list of some of the other invaders of the Great Lakes. And the point here is not so much for you to memorize all this list, but get an idea of how extensive this problem can be. So one of the first ones um, was that caused major changes was the sea lamprey. And as the shipping canals got put in throughout the northeastern United States, they connected the Atlantic, the, the streams that <coughs> flow into the Atlantic with the Great Lakes. And they weren't connected with sea lampreys before. Why is that? What is it that physically separated the Great Lakes from the Atlantic Ocean? What physical feature? A waterfall. A waterfall, yes. Which waterfall would that be? Niagara, Niagara Falls. Good, right? So Niagara Falls is a pretty big waterfall. A sea lamprey can't make it up, and the river has to go over that to get out. Once these shipping canals came in all through it and allowed these to move in, had huge effects on the lake trout fishery in, in that um, in that place. And there was a large commercial fishery that, that basically crashed after the lamprey got in and took many of those out. Um, and then we have a whole series of other things. Um, purple loose stripe, which can take over wetlands, and there's a bit in the book on that. Um, and that came in with solid ship ballast. So sometimes ships would load rocks and dirt and stuff in as opposed to just pumping water in. And particularly um, when they didn't have holds that held, that they didn't have big tanks that could hold water. So basically wooden ships or ships that weren't, weren't sealed up as well on the inside. And then a whole series of ones, the Chinook salmon and the common carp, they were introductions, both of them. Uh, common carp released in much of the United States from Europe because there's a food fish there, but but not here so much. Uh, and uh, it's a good it's a good uh, food food fish, but it causes real big problems because it eats all the macrophytes and stirs up the sediments a lot, and it can it can really change the system. I have a question. Okay. The second one, the purple, um, is that a fish? Is that a? No, that's a plant. A plant. <laughs> purple loose stripe is a plant. Yeah, so most of these are fish, I guess, or or at least animals, but that's a, that's a plant. Um, we can just go down through the list. Brown trout introduced, you know, a whole bunch of different. Here's another plant, water milfoil, um, zebra mussel, and this is just a partial list. There's literally a hundred or so species that have come in, and and more all the time. So what is happening now? To change this is that they're trying to they're, they're trying to exchange ballast water in the middle of the ocean, and it's going to go a long way towards towards taking care of this problem. So when they get halfway across the ocean, they dump all the fresh water that they took off on the port in Europe, and they repump in salt water into the to, into the ballast tanks, and that basically means that you're going to get rid of most of those most of those species that were included in ballast water. And we can see a lot of these came in through ballast, ballast water, all, all these down the bottom. And, and uh, so that's going to take care of a lot of it. And then also the laws that don't allow you to bring in or import species. Um, and so it's, it, it's um, how would you say, it's a little bit irksome when you travel internationally and come in and they're looking through your luggage for agricultural products and whatnot. But there's actually good reasons for that. We know that. Okay, so the other side of the coin is we've got this world where there's some species are just found everywhere. Other species, um, many other species are, are going to stay. And, and, and now, um, extinction rates are about a million times greater than they have been historically. So there's no way that evolution can keep up with extinction. Essentially, over a long view, Evolutionary rates have slightly exceeded extinction rates, and over the long view, there's been this gradual increase in species diversity since life evolved, right? And then every once in a while, there's a massive dis extinction. There, there's, you know, six major extinctions, and we humans are causing the sixth major extinction, on par with a meteor uh, hitting the Earth or something like that. And we don't know what the old, the causes of the oldest extinctions are, um, but on par with that. Aquatic e 
ecosystems are extraordinarily vulnerable to extinction. And there are several reasons for that. One of the major reasons is that they integrate everything that's happening on the land. And so, in terrestrially, you can have a little negative poisonous effect in one spot, but if you go over a mile from that spot, it doesn't have much influence. But if you have a little poisonous effect in that one spot, everything downstream that that drains into is influenced all the way down, right? So it's integrating everything that's going on upstream, and it, that has a big effect. The second is that people just have a tremendous demand for water, so they're really taking a lot of water out of the system. Um, and the third is that they're, you know, with the large fishes, um, they're pretty vulnerable to over-exploitation, and almost every major fishery that's out there, the fish have been over-exploited in. And it's, it's the history of mankind, that if you have a lot of big fish and you have people near them, then they come and take them all away. And so we have all the marine fisheries just crashing basically because of that, the really large fish. We're feeding further and further down the food chain as, as humanity. There's exceptions to that, obviously. There's, um, in the United States, we don't actually use a lot of fish as a commodity as much as some other parts of their parts of the world. So there are species that are considered trash species, they're not recreational, could be considered food species that are doing quite well. Um, but I'm talking about the broad scale of, over the entire earth, how many species we have. Um, and the suggestion is that the most endangered groups of animals are, um, are the fishes uh, and, and the amphibians that are associated with freshwater. On Earth is, is you know maybe 30 to 50 percent of the species are <coughs> in danger of extinction or have already gone extinct. So it's extraordinarily high high levels. Some uh, big examples here. Lake Victoria is a big example, and it's an area that had explosive speciation. 300 species evolved in 12,000 years. So that, that's that's extraordinarily fast. It's probably the fastest rate of radiation of, of any group of organisms known. Um, and it's quite a bunch of diversity. But of those 300, 200 of, of those have gone extinct, and this isn't the last decade, but it's several decades ago. It took about 10 or 20 years after the in introduction of the Nile, introduction of Nile perch, and then also pollution causing the lake to go in oxygen declines. And Nile perch is a very large fish, um, is commercially uh, important. It can be uh, caught in, in nets with larger boats and then put off into um, markets, exported into markets. Unfortunately, what happened is the Nile perch went into this lake, ate all the smaller fish, but the people that live around the lake only have small boats and small nets, so they can't physically handle catching the Nile perch. And so it, it crashed the fishery for the people that, that were using the fishes to feed themselves and had been for, you know, for mo way more than 12,000 years. Um, and, but also created a fish that they can't afford to buy in the markets, and so it gets, gets sent away. So it's, it's, it's had these sort of cascading social ramifications, in addition to the loss of biodiversity with these 200 species going extinct in that particular lake. In the United States, um, threatened or endangered, we have 73 fish species, 69 bivalves, many of these unionized mussels, um, some snails, amphibians, crustaceans listed as endangered. And the, the big group is the union of mussel species that are endangered. Um, this, this is a real problem because these things take a long time to reproduce. And so if you set up situations where they can't reproduce, it looks like they're hanging on, but there's no young ones coming on. So an example, um, in Iowa, John Downing and his student went out and resurveyed sites in around 2000, 20 years after the last survey, it was in 1980. Not big change on the landscape, but they lost a lot of mussel species, and it's probably because they just had gotten near the end of their lifespan and were not able to ever reproduce and keep the population going. We have similar things going on with the United mussels in, in southeast Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, and Karen Vaughn, who works at University of Oklahoma, has also shown how we get these smaller populations of mussels because we're sort of hammering them and getting the population smaller and smaller, and there's only so much suitable habitat. Then you add on top of that this extreme drought that we had 
and it just really caused some of these populations to blink out. So they get vulnerable, we make them more vulnerable in that natural variability that occurs, there isn't a population that can withstand it. So it's another thing that, we're, that humanity's doing that doesn't have this right away effect, but eventually will lead to the extinction of species. And this is irreversible, this is truly irreversible um, type of, of effect that humans have on the environment, right? So you are probably living in a time when you'll, when half the species on Earth will disappear uh, from the face of the Earth. The bulk of those being in tropical rainforests and in coral reefs. And the coral reefs are endangered from over-exploitation and also because increases in carbon dioxide acidify the ocean as it dissolves into the carbon, into the, into the ocean, makes it very difficult for organisms that use calcium carbonate either as a shell or as an external structure like corals do to build that structure. And so it's going to drive a bunch of them out just because of, it's, an, it's another effect of humans releasing CO2 into the atmosphere that is not necessarily related to global warming. You put on top of that, the corals have a very narrow temperature band that they can survive in, um, and we're pushing them out of that band, okay? And, that, and so there's these two stresses going on, and coastal nutrient pollution and sediment pollution are, are big issues in many places in the world. So you put all those together, those are the big areas. But proportionally, the freshwater is gonna lose at, at least this much, right? So, so if you get a chance to go out snorkeling, do it. Um, because when you're my age, they, there might not be much left for you to see. Uh, this is a cheery lecture, isn't it? <laughs> and so just to cheer you up even more, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some work that I've uh, done in Panama in the past, another set of species extinctions. And this is a, a species extinction um, from uh, a fungus that's been introduced to North America. It's not exactly clear where that fungus came from, probably because came in on African clawed frogs, um, and they're used for research purposes, and they also used to be used as a pregnancy test uh, before they had antibodies and all the, um, all the um, more sophisticated ways they have of, of, of determining pregnancy now. And they just take serum from a woman, inject it in a female frog, and it would cause it to lay eggs if she was, if she was pregnant. So it was, a, it was a, an old school uh, pregnancy test. These frogs were put all over the place, and they have a fungus that Danelle has actually worked on quite a bit. And Danelle, uh, as an undergraduate, did research on that fungus moving about in Idaho and some of the problems that it caused. Do you want to say anything about that at all? Your frogs are cool. Your frogs are cool. Kittred is bad. Kittred, yes. Yeah. So it's a kit, it's a, uh, what is it? Uh, Batrachio kittrium dendrobotatus. Batrachio kittrium dendrobotatus. Okay, so it's a chytrid fungus. Um, and it's moved through many parts of the world. In, a, in Central America, what it does is it, in, the in a fairly narrow temperature band, it alters the ability of the frogs to regulate moisture across their skin. And amphibians are extraordinarily sensitive to this because they, they have to keep their skin wet and they have to maintain water balance or they'll die. Um, but it's in this narrow temperature band. So in the warm areas, the fungus can infect the amphibians and spread through the populations and not kill them. But in the cooler areas, in the higher elevation areas, it will kill essentially everything that's there. And so Central America has this chain of mountains that's running through it and has these areas that are cool high and the areas that are warm in the lowlands. Those cool areas have a unique assemblage of amphibians that have evolved there because they they're honed in on those particular temperatures. So this wave of disease has moved through Central America and has, when it hits these higher elevation areas, all the frogs die and you lose a bunch of species. And it's really literally to the point where I have a colleague that worked in this, in this forest for um, 20 years in, in the uh, what is the eastern, easternmost part of Costa Rica because it's starting to swing around where it hits Panama right there. And she was out there when the infection hit and like frogs were literally dying and falling out of the trees. 
and she was finding species after 20 years that she'd never seen before because they had been up in the trees that she couldn't get to them. But so the first time they were described by science was was her being there to, to find the dying animals, basically. Um, when we went down to Panama, we did an experiment where we uh, went into a stream that had a hundred or so tadpoles per square meter of stream bottom when we got there. And um, we, we looked at the rate of nitrogen uptake and metabolism and looked at periphyton and just how the ecosystem worked essentially. And I mean, literally, there's so many frogs that when you walked on the side of the stream, you could basically barely not step on them. They're just you know scattering everywhere. They're calling all the time. Um, and there's some real spectacular colored ones, and you know some not so spectacular. But they're all all a very 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 active amphibian community. Um, so we went back two years later after the disease had passed, and there was nothing. There were no frogs. And when we count this up, like I don't know, maybe two tadpoles in the stream over the entire two weeks that we were there, as opposed to, you know, a hundred for this every this much stream. And so they completely disappeared. They were eating algae, the algae took off, the nutrient uptake changed, so the whole ecosystem, it cascaded to this whole ecosystem. In addition, there are species of snakes that are adapted just to eat the amphibians as they emerge and come out of the stream, and they'll, they'll, they will probably be lost as well, so they're doing surveys to see that. Um, when you talk about an extinction, I don't think it really hits home until you experience something like that. I mean, go somewhere, I mean, maybe it's like, I don't know, going back to where there is a wetland or a forest that was always there when you were a kid and coming back and there's a Walmart there and it's in a, in a parking lot there instead, right? It kind of hits you at that level. Um, but that's what people are doing. Um, and that one is unstoppable. It will go out through the world and we'll, and we'll because of that and other stresses, we'll probably lose a substantial portion of the amphibian biodiversity that there is on Earth. There's something humans are doing to like propagate chytrid fungus, or is it just moving through on its own? Or? Yeah, it's, it's unstoppable. I mean, moving species around is, has caused it to move faster. Um, there, it, it sort of shows up in spots. So it showed up in a couple of spots in South America, and the disease actually is moving down from North America through Central America and then also moving up from South America, probably because animals were either from the pet trade or other reasons were picked up and released uh, into the environment. This one's, you know, this one, you can't do anything about it basically, other than there's an amphibian rescue center or there's people that are pulling frogs out of the natural habitat and keeping them from the fungus and propagating them. But Failure. <laughs> well, it works, except for you can't ever release them back in. So you can go back to the same habitat five years later and release them back in, and they just die. They just catch the disease and die. So it's, it's sort of in there, um, in, in the environment. It doesn't go away after it goes through. It's not, it's, a, it's not a very specific disease. It's just sort of it's a fungus that's everywhere once it gets into, in, into an area. So it's not like permafrost, like it's there, and it's just, it'll be there to stay. Right, yeah, so it's not like, I don't know, myxomitosis or something, the rabbit virus, right, that they put in Australia that sweeps through and kills, but then once it's gone, it's gone. All the rabbits are gone, the virus goes with them. And part of that is because these other species serve as reservoirs, the ones in the lowlands, they serve as reservoirs for it, so there's some that can withstand it in the warmer areas. Some <coughs> great stuff that's come up, it turns out because of global warming, the hydrologic cycle is more active and so some areas where you wouldn't think they would be uh, the, the, it would be a problem have actually had more problems because there's more rain more clouds and it got a little bit cooler and pushed them into this area into this temperature zone where the, where the disease is fatal for the amphibians um, you know so there's strange specifics same disease in Australia appears not to be have the same temperature relationships the Australian amphibians tend not to be resistant to it in general and it's warmer because there's not those cold areas. Um, yeah, so this is just, that's just the frog that, that got it um, and it's dying in the field. Uh, and then this is just, you know, the scientists there are grabbing as many of these animals and pickling them as they can. And there are new species in here that will be just 
described by somebody in a museum, but will never be seen alive in the wild. And, that, and that's, you know, that's the reality. Bleach your boots. Huh? Bleach your boots. People don't do it, but.